Mike, I have a question for you. What do Fremen actually eat? I, that's a very good question. Welcome to the Context Club, the place where hopefully weekly-ish we will provide clues, context, and continuity for you and your everyday life and I guess our surrounding video games, comic books, pop culture, films. I'm Evan Campbell. I'm here with Mike Williams. What's up, dude? Hello, hello, folks. I'm uh, doing pretty well. I, I can't... Oh. Uh, that wasn't meant to be a pun. I'm doing, doing pretty <laughs> doing, well. Doing pretty well. Yeah. Um, Nailed it. Wasn't wasn't meant to be, but, you know, these things happen. So, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking a bit uh, surrounding Dune Part 2. That is doing quite well at the box office. Uh, at the time of this recording, it has made $162 million domestic and $374 million worldwide. And uh, talking about, you know, where the series may go in the future, the surrounding things that are, are happening in the storyline uh, after that. But uh, before we get there, what did you think of the movie? I loved it. That, it was It's my favorite, like, theater-going experience and probably the last decade. It was just such a fun time to go to the movies and see like a science fiction film that reminded me of the old times when science fiction was weird and crazy and you'd never seen anything like it. Um, so I got to see it in my local theater, which has an AMC. This like uh, the you know Dolby sound and visuals. Uh, just like I know people were a lot of people the, like the IMAX stuff in LA is all booked out, right? People trying to see it there, but like I saw it with just the uh, double digital setup essentially and the sound just pump through when there's worm sign the seats are like shaking and stuff and i'm just like this is a very okay so you, you at least got that experience i did yeah. uh my local imax and yeah whenever the worm sign is happening <laughs> like you feel it in the seats uh which uh is a wonderful effect that uh, i definitely will not be able to replicate in my home right home theater so <laughs> Um, it was good to experience it in that style, yeah, at least once. Um, the only thing I, I'm honestly missing is there'd be like occasional time where I couldn't understand what was being said because the music or something was swelling over it. So, uh, I will look forward to watching it at home oh, with I subtitles see. on because we watch everything with subtitles on. We are we are broken like that now. <laughs> I, you know, I didn't used to do that, but then after having kids, you kind of got to, you got to adapt. You don't want them waking up, uh, you know, in the middle of Dune or whatever else <laughs> you're watching. So, sometimes, so I became a subtitle person very quickly. And yeah, man, you just, you got to get yours however you get it. But I highly recommend if you haven't seen it in theaters, it's definitely worth going to see. You know, part one was already pretty good. I think we all knew what to expect with part two, at least a little bit knew that it was going to be an enjoyable time. And yeah, I just, it did not disappoint. Like, I feel like maybe the back half felt a little bit rushed. I mean, even though like you, you talk about old Dune movies and adaptations, like the, the story is so massive and things like, I, I thought like once we got towards the end, it's like, oh, they got to wrap this up because we're running out of time. Like they're running out of time. The movie can only be so long or whatever. I, I would have happily like watched another, like I would have watched Dune part three. That was still in the first book happily like it, it's just such a fun thing to see yeah i will say i was a slightly lukewarm on the first on part one because it is the part of the book <laughs> that is mostly set up yes yeah and part two is where a lot of you know following uh the destruction of house atreides and the death of duke leto like this is where a lot of the emotions are a lot of the connections between Paul and the Fremen uh, and sort of his mother's machinations and him sort of attempting to run away from what his future will be. Um, and a lot of that emotional stuff happens in part two. And I, I think the director even mentioned that um, he thought part two was like, a much stronger film because the emotions are, are much stronger there and you can deliver on them and you can see this 
um, rise of Paul or, or fall, however you take it. Sure. Um, it, it definitely feels more like a, a more dynamic kind of narrative arc than if you've only been experienced to like the, the sci-fi miniseries of Dune or the, uh, the old, um, gosh, who's the director's name? People are just going to slay me already. Yeah, it's David Lynch. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. I know. I just, I have a bad memory. David, the David Lynch Dune, right? Like you don't get a lot of that, that feeling of, um, like almost like a remorse, like of where like Paul knows what he has to do, but he doesn't want to do it. Like maybe there's some of that in there, but it's not like laid on as thick as they do in this adaptation of it, as well as kind of the, his frustrations with his mother of like kind of conniving and, and, and doing things like the Benny Gesserit way, which is, which is really cool. It felt like a new leaf was turned there. And I know some of that is there in the, those original adaptations, but like it definitely felt, it felt more kind of present here. Yeah. The Lynch version feels more like just a straight uh, hero's journey, like yeah. rise, rise into your power and go. Yes. Whereas this one, like Paul is dreading it right up until the point that he takes the plunge and then like you see it like he becomes a different person um so kudos to chalamet who i mean the the cast in this is fantastic across the board Gosh, um, yeah uh but i will say that uh chalamet zendaya and uh austin butler who um is only in this film and honestly doesn't get as much time as you would think across the entire story does what he can with his limited screen time as fade or author sort of the let's call him evil paul yeah sure yeah that that whole sequence right with the with the, the harkonnen homeworld and the the fireworks it's just looking like ink blots in the sky like that just oh, visually is beautiful just just a, yeah. just a stunning stunning thing <laughs> Um, and I mean, that's part of the strength of this. Um, the story is pretty straightforward, but the strength is sort of selling the scale and the vibe of this unique world, um, which is why I think um, that, you know, we're going to be talking sort of around the film itself. Um, Denny has said that he's only going to be doing one more film. Man. Um, which will be feelings. Dune Messiah, which is the next book. So Dune Part 1 and 2 were just the first book. Dune Messiah is the second book. Right on. Yeah, that, that's right. We've got a couple of stories lined up. We can we can jump over into the, the facts portion here of the show, I think, or kind of line it up. Uh, so, yeah, obviously it's successful in the box office. Uh, if you wanted to go over any of these numbers or talk about what do you think lended uh, to its success this time around versus... I, I think versus we've it. sort of... Uh, I've seen a lot of talk that people were just bored. Like, we go to the movies to be entertained, and part of that entertainment is wanting to see something new and different, and we haven't had something like this for quite a while. Like just this grand, weird vision that the director was just allowed to deliver without anyone getting in his way. And I think that that's uh, a, an amazing thing and why it's doing so well is because we don't get a lot of stuff like that. Now, uh, I think it's going to probably do... Um, I mean, I'm not talking like billion dollars here, but the first one did, I believe, around like 400 million. Um, but that also came out on HBO Max day and date during the pandemic. Um, I'm feeling this one's probably going to get to like 650 million, which is still very successful um, and definitely successful enough that I think Legendary will go, yeah, go ahead, Denny, and make your third film. Um, Denny has already said, like he he has ever since part one came out, has said, I'm gonna do part one, part two, and then I want to do Messiah. Uh, and in a recent uh uh interview, he said, uh, hey, the screenplay is almost finished, but it is not finished. 
it'll take a little time. There's the uh, there's a dream of making a third movie. It would make absolute sense to me. Um, of course, the the uh, dip in there is the fact that uh, for filmmakers and for crew, doing films like this is years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> so for for Denny in particular, he's like, I don't know exactly when I will go back to Arrakis. So he has uh, a couple of other films. We'll talk about those in a sec. But for right now, Dune Messiah's script is almost done. He's been working with the composer, uh, Hans Zimmer, for the uh, themes for that next film. Uh, and he has no further plans beyond Dune, like after Messiah. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk more in a bit. There are a total of six books written by original for the Frank Herbert. Uh, but for Denny, Dune Messiah will be the last film for him. Uh, he told Time, like everyone has been asking, was like, hey, there's so many more books. There's so much more that you can do. Um, are you going to just keep on going? For him, no. Like once he finishes Messiah, that's it. And Messiah really ends as sort of the story of Paul Atreides. So with his current cast, he can do uh, sort of his trilogy and be done. So uh, instead, he'll he'll in the future he's already announced that he's doing a uh, another adaptation of Cleopatra, of which there are like three. But more importantly, he's going to tackle uh, Rendezvous with Rama, which is another classic uh, science fiction story written by Arthur C. Clarke. Another one of those stories that. Most directors probably wouldn't get a budget and space to tackle in, yeah. say, modern filmmaking. I'm not as familiar with that one, but I think people, a lot of people said the same thing about Foundation, right? And Apple went after that. Yes. And, yeah. and that is part of the thing. Like, we are really starting starting to feast. Um, some <laughs> of that was the streaming boom. Uh, some of that, some others. I mean, we got stuff like uh, Annihilation which is another thing that I was like, oh, wow, I don't think most people would get a chance to do that. Um, uh, Denis got a chance to do um, Dune, and hopefully uh, it sounds like he'll get to Messiah. Uh, we're getting rendezvous with Rama. Foundation, despite the changes from the book, is very good. Uh, also on Apple is Silo. Uh, and Silo's will... great. I, I can talk about Silo. We could do a whole episode on Silo. It's just so good. Yeah, and so Silo good. is uh, another uh, novel project. And uh, mm -hmm. Apple also has For All Mankind, which I'm, I'm just going to pimp out. If you haven't watched it, it's a alternate history of the U.S. space race. Fantastic show. Uh, if you are a fan of the recent Oscar uh, multi-winner Oppenheimer, For All Mankind, will probably uh, tickle your fancy. How do you feel about, you know, before we get too much further, just kind of the, the well, one, I think you have a really unique perspective because you've read a lot of the source material on Dune, right? And uh, as far as, um, you know, Denny stepping away after a third movie, do you think that's kind of the right call? Like, are you sad to see him go? How do you feel about it? It's, it's interesting because I think it's probably the right call. Again, this is, this is years of a person's life. So like <sighs> Dune part one came out in 2021. I believe they probably would have started that like 2017 maybe or something like that. Thereabouts. So from 2017 to 2024, that's seven years. So like you add messiah on that that's probably going to be like over a decade of his life having to sit out and film stuff in not sets only but he is a very big proponent of shooting in real places which means they're out in the desert like shooting this film uh that can take a toll so even if like like you have a real love of the story 
I could see him just being like, I just, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> He's like, these are the stories that I wanted to get out and I'm done. Now, the trick is uh, Dune is, uh, so these are distributed through Warner Brothers, but they are produced largely by Legendary uh, of the uh, Godzilla and Kong MonsterVerse fame. So <laughs> I would expect, while Denis may, may say, hey, I'm done, Legendary will find someone to do the other i i think they'll find someone to do the other books as long as this is profitable to them but how far can they go because that stuff gets off the rails right do you want it like for people who are uninitiated i mean we don't want to spoil the story but like the books get we get weird yeah yeah so that's that's i think the, and that's part of what we're we're, we're going to talk about today like i don't want to we'll we'll skip talking really about um Dune Messiah, which is probably going to come out near term, and I don't necessarily want to spoil that for for people. But that is the end of the story of Paul Atreides. Uh, it yeah, will be his. That's a good way to put it. Rise and fall. His arc is done. Um, over the course of Dune and Dune Messiah. Uh, and from Herbert himself, when he was talking, he actually wrote um, the first three books sort of relatively close together, and they were fresh in his mind. And there's, like, he he says he conceived of it as a long novel. Uh, a whole trilogy is one book about the messianic convulsions that periodically overtake us. Demagogues, fanatics, con game artists, the innocent and the not so innocent bystanders, all were to have a part in the drama. Uh, this goes from my theory that superheroes are disastrous for mankind. Even if we find a real hero, eventually fallible mortals take over the power structure that always comes to being around a leader. And so this then is one of the one of my themes of do. Don't give over all of your critical faculties to people in power, no matter how admirable those people appear to be. Beneath the hero's facade, you will find a human, be human being who makes human mistakes. Enormous problems arise when human mistakes are made on the grand scale available to a superhero. And sometimes you run into another problem. And it's, it's real interesting. Um, it feels timely, like we have the rise of uh like superheroes have been a power of pop culture for a very long time but we've seen the rise of them in films and then at the same time some of the stuff he's talking about about demagogues and fanatics and con game artists uh feels politically relevant <laughs> even now um do you want to connect the dots on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to say anything, um, <laughs> but to say that sure. uh, the the stuff that he's dealing with in Dune uh, and eventually Messiah feels relevant to now, and I, I feel like Villeneuve uh, leans into a lot of that in the film. Um, definitely, as Paul sort of rises into his power structure the the voice against the voice of herbert becomes chani who is definitely like what what are we doing here like like i don't think any of this is good so while everyone else is is bowing and bending the knee chani is the lone person who is like nah i've slept with this guy uh, <laughs> we're, we're doing we're doing some wrong stuff here Sure. I'm just going to have to like dip out. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's one of the, the best strengths of this newest ad adaptation of Dune, right? Because in the other ones, it ends and it's kind of just like, you know, Paul Atreides is flanked by both women on either side, the, the emperor's daughter and then Chani on the other side. And it's like, oh, okay, well, like they're just going to make this work somehow. But like you actually getting this kind of more true to the source kind of material where you finish that second movie and it's like, Chani, I mean, outside of being 
uh, like a hard conan soldier that gets murdered but like obviously has been hurt the worst like in all this right this person who she's like except was an outsider but then fell in love with and then just gives her heart crushed right and, and kind of a lot of different senses of the word where it, it, it seems like there's a lot of hope right that that paul could be this person to really help the fremen kind of break the cycle kind of and, and it's kind of like um I mean, it's almost like a white savior story to an extent, right? I mean, there's definitely themes of that trope in there, right? And then so for Chani to kind of like get over that, right? And be like, well, actually, you're okay. And actually now, like, I love you more than anything in the galaxies, right? In the universe. And then to have it, like, Paul kind of rise to where he does and then makes the decisions he does for, like, you know, the betterment, I guess, of, like, the entire planet, um, and they'll get in more into that, right? Obviously, in the new book, but like it, it's it's kind of heavy stuff, and it's like more a lot more complex than than like your average like movie going experience. Yeah, right? and I mean to tie it back to that superheroes, it's very much the the Doctor Strange Infinity War moment of like we have one option, um, and like seeing through all of these different realities, and this is the one that will get my family through and the Fremen through in the best way possible. The problem, of course, being uh, the best is is a very malleable concept, and it, um, how many have to die to hit that, that best, what, what the later books called the golden path. Um, like, it's sort of like the difference between, say, like, like six billion people dying <laughs> and four billion people dying, like you hmm. still like yes, two billion less people died, but the people still died in the end. Hmm. And and no matter how present Paul gets or how superhumanly strong he gets, he still has to sort of exist in a world of very human power structures. And that's how Herbert sort of envisioned it. And he even says, uh, you know, in the, from the quotes I was reading before, like what makes a Nixon? What part do the meek play in creating the powerful? And if a leader cannot admit mistakes, then these mistakes will be hidden. But who says our leaders must be perfect? Where do they learn this? And that's, again, that's, that's stuff that you, you look sort of to the world now and it's very much like still 100% relevant. Like why do leaders have to be infallible? Uh, and once you start on the myth of saying my leader cannot do any wrong, then what things are you hiding? What mistakes, what atrocities do you hide to make that work? And like at the very end of Dune Part Two, when uh, Paul calls for the beginning of the Holy War, and the Furman march right into the ships that the Sadakar came down in, <laughs> and it's like, did we really change anything? Like, yes, we did, but it's still not. It's not great. <laughs> Yeah, I think that there's a bigger question there of like, well, now you're in charge and what kind of decisions are you going to make, right? Like, like you that that's a really, it's not even a metaphor at that point, right? Like literally taking over the ships from the Sardaukar and then taking them up, right, to kind of fight the the rest of the, the galaxy. Uh, it, it's, gosh, it, it's just something I feel like we still have in spades in terms of there's a lot of old science fiction that tackles these themes, but uh, to get an adaptation like this and to have it just done so well and so right, just it's just such a win. It's just such a win for nerds and people like me everywhere. <laughs> like, I'm just pumped on it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's good to, to use these adaptations to say something. Like, even, sure. uh, like, right now, we're in the middle of sort of this not very appraisal uh, a lot of people are seeing the love of uh, Starship Troopers again. Oh, sure. Yes. Uh, with, Helldivers 2. Sure. Right. Because of Helldivers 2 and Starship Troopers, uh, if anything, goes in the opposite direction of the original uh, novel by Robert Heinlein. Um, but it has something to say. So it pulls it off, even if it's not 
uh, particularly faithful to the source material. And I think in this case, um, Villeneuve is very faithful to the source material, at least in the thrusts and where Herbert was coming from. And I think he leans into some of that stuff a little bit more, especially knowing, I, I guess, in his head, like once he got through part one and part one was financially successful and people are, are really vibing with part two, he knows he'll get Messiah out and Messiah can sort of finish off Paul's story <laughs> as the, the, as the savior, so to speak. I know you're being careful, really careful there, but I guess for people who maybe watch the movie, um, is there anything you would say to them to kind of like, pique their interest a little more like where do we go from here what what would you say is like maybe the prologue or the kind of the setup uh stuff that we've kind of just been talking about i think it might be helpful to kind of ground it a little if if the end of dune part two is all sad times um then dune messiah is the sad times continue uh until like there's no like particularly joyful uh maybe there's no, there's no real joy <laughs> in Doom Messiah. It's it's going to be all sad times, all the way down. Very much like um, everyone's favorite uh, grand ensemble tragedy, Game of Thrones. Um, there were ensemble tragedies before, and there will be after. But in terms of pop culture, it's just easier for a lot of people to just say Game of Thrones. Sure. I think that's fair. Uh, I think that's fair. Did did you want to talk about these? Uh, you pulled some book covers for us to look at. Did you want to take a look at these now? You want to save them? Yeah, or? yeah. Let's talk about them. So, so, um, like I said, Villeneuve might end up with Messiah. He says that's going to be his last one. But uh, from 1965 to 1985, Herbert himself, Frank Herbert, wrote six dune novels uh dune dune messiah children of dune god emperor dune heretics of dune and chapter house dune now there are books beyond those six uh his son brian and kevin j anderson wrote a ton more novels in fact they had one come out in like 2022 i think um but fans are not happy with most of those novels uh <laughs> i haven't read most of them I, I i've read like a couple of them um but you know they they weren't necessarily my cup of tea and the image of course that you're showing here these are some of the these are the classic covers i believe there were a set of covers before that but these are the ones that i have like personally <laughs> So, um, like, not these books, but the books with these covers are the ones that I have personally. Uh, so Increasing in value as we speak, man. It's, it's just bizarre. <laughs> no, about all that. Like, uh, <laughs> be sure my um, my Children of Dune and God Emperor Dune are in heinous, heinous. Uh, <laughs> and Chapter House also, I believe, is in heinous shape uh, because they are very old books and. Uh, at the time I got them, I don't think I cared about keeping them in good shape. Uh, I think it's, it's just part of the reading experience as you're going through your mental anguish is is trapped in the book, which also takes on uh, physical damage. Yeah, like which <laughs> which also is like wild because like I also don't reread uh, novels like the reread them in novel form like at this point i buy the physical version to put on a shelf and then just read the uh the kindle version oh, okay yeah yeah i see it yeah so now all of your books are yeah. pristine yeah so so like skipping past messiah because i want to let fans sort of have that experience whenever it comes like that's probably what like 2025 it's out there it's gonna be a while um, and they're taking a break, like we kind of talked about, right? And I don't, they didn't say how long that break is going to be. So, yeah, it could just be a really long while before <laughs> before we see another Dune. Yeah, it's it's going to be at least long enough for him to maybe do like one other film, maybe two. Who knows? 
he'll get there eventually. Um, Dune Messiah takes place in their continuity like seven or eight years after Dune. So giving uh, Chalamet and Zendaya time to age will probably be <laughs> a a good thing. Do you um, think they sh- they shot? St- well, they probably didn't shoot stuff already. I would assume, but I mean, I imagine they could bank some stuff just to have in case. But I I mean, they might yeah. do some stuff, but I I I don't really think they they need it. Just it. because of the where that story is, like, um, but skipping past Dune Messiah because again, I want to keep that over there. The sure. next one will be Children of Dune, uh, which is where it like fully settles into that. Like after Messiah, it's all essentially house wars, like political machinations, and different factions all trying to control this vast empire. So Children of Doom, the children in the title are uh, Paul's children, his twin children, Leto II and Ganema. Um, And I will say, I'm not going to say who's uh, the mother. We'll leave that out there. Who who knows? There's two ladies out there. Let's let's (laughs) at least two. At least two. I mean, you know, Paul is now at the top of this game. He, 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 there's no more famous person in, in the entire uh, United Galaxies, right? Like, who, who could say? Who could say? Yeah. And uh, the king, mother is. King, kings and queens are wont to have uh, multiple children and multiple consorts. So uh, who knows where the directions will go? Uh, <laughs> but it is basically his children sort of trying to survive uh in a world that wants them dead and wants to take the power back uh and they are under the guardianship of paul's sister alia who we saw mostly as a fetus uh, a talking looking fetus in dune part two Uh, absolutely wild and incredible choice (laughs) and and briefly as uh anya taylor joy yes in a single (laughs) scene i actually forgot about that Oh my god! That's yeah, so, so um, expect that yeah. uh, she uh, will return in some fashion. That is sort of a forward casting, um, and gosh, that that is like having a life debt, dude. That's like, I mean, I, I don't know if she's locked in for Messiah, right? But you know, this huge project is coming, and you probably would want the role, I would assume. But like just being like, oh yeah, I'm I'm Aaliyah. So when when the call comes, basically all of my life has to stop so that I can go into the desert and shoot this movie. Yeah, and, and there's yeah. there's another Incredible. character that I will not spoil in part one who is also a four yes. cast. Sure, like, yes. Who yeah. is who is a very large part of Messiah onward as a character, but only appeared in part one. Yes. Oh, so, yes. I'm excited. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> it's going to be, um, well, well, clones. There's a lot of, it's just Children of Dune. Uh, Messiah will get into some of that. Children of Dune will get into some of that more where we're talking uh, genetic <laughs> memory, a lot of politics. We're talking clones. We're talking, uh, like, it's where it gets real real weird and sort of the concepts um and i mean for children of dune leto 2 and ganama sort of have to retain control of rakis and the empire while everyone is sort of from many sides there's house karina which is the emperor's house that wants to take over power again uh Aaliyah is sort of going through her own very weird thing <laughs> uh, in relation to family heritage sure. um and it's just sort of everyone coming at them and uh them ultimately having to make choices that are very similar uh to paul uh in that uh, I, again in herbert's mind power in the end will always 
falter and it makes mistakes and it will screw up. And as when you're, you're talking a galactic empire where one or two people control the fate of many worlds and billions or trillions of lives, like the mistakes become that much more violent and horrible. Uh, and yeah, Children of Dune is probably uh, in, in the similar way that Dune and Dune Sire are Paul's story. Children of Dune in the next book, God Emperor of Dune, uh, is the story of Paul's son, Leto II, who is uh, of the two kids probably the more impactful. Uh, and God Emperor of Dune details Leto's reign as the God Emperor for thousands of years after the choices he makes in Children of Dune. And you have the cover right there <laughs> with the worm, yes. with the dude's face in it. And <laughs> if you have ever heard of Dune fans talking about Worm Emperor, <sighs> That's God in a burr of doom. You, you, you step on that path in Children of Dune, but the full guy who is also a worm that the fans are like, that's, that's it. That's the thing I want to see. That's God in burr of doom. Is that what you're looking forward to? Because I'm not sure if I, if I, I, if I want to see. I, like I said, these books, they just really start to, to go places. I, I don't know. And I don't know if, if, uh, like again, Villeneuve. I think part of it is he doesn't necessarily want to deal with this. Like he sort of skipped over some of the weirder things, like the the navigators and part yes. one. Yeah. Um, which is also a very weird concept. And I think there's he wants to deal with the human emotions and the grandeur of this world. But I, I'm not. I'm not saying afraid. <laughs> I, I just think he doesn't necessarily want to deal with some of that stuff uh, because how, it would how convenient be, as, yeah. as we ourselves are facing our own, uh, you know, AI kind of uprising here with, you know, different uh, third party platforms and, and open AI and chat bots and all of that stuff in the world of Dune, right? Like that stuff is all already, they've gone through that course and their solution is to make like organic living computers essentially right like that's what navigators are they're like right they yeah. they uh, i don't know if they had, did they ever mention in part one it's the butlerine jihad uh yeah. is what it was called uh and i i will also say despite uh Doom I, part I feel... one and two having a lot of um a lot of links to real world conflicts generally involving the middle east uh, it was interesting how they avoided saying jihad again for part two. Like they were very yeah. purposeful, like begin the holy war. Like, I mean, we know what you're talking about. Yeah, right. It's like not, it's, <laughs> there's not that much going on here, right? It's not like that much fuzz or static or kind of dressing around this stuff. So uh, that part is interesting. And, and I think we do get to see the navigators like at some point in part two, but I think they just look like people. They just look like weird people sitting at consoles and their eyes are kind of like glossed over. I thought that might have been what it was, but I could be wrong because they might not be even. If they were daring to show them, I, I'm sure Denny would have made it like uh, like an incredible composition like we see with a lot of the ship stuff because the navigators aren't just like normal. Yeah, I, I think those might have were supposed to be their human calculators. Um, oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, Mentats. Mentats. Got it. Yeah. Uh, I think that was supposed to be Harkon and uh, Mentats uh, crunching the numbers and doing everything. But yes, this Doom, again, the, the, the connections are many uh, <laughs> to the real world, uh, yeah. is a world that they fought a war against machines and ultimately decided that um, machines and AI suck and <laughs> we will not be going down that path. Instead, we will go down the path of... Um, uh, creating superhuman uh, but sometimes uh, broken humans and sure. using them to power all of our uh, our day-to-day our -day life and travel and whatnot. 
Right, all through like space cocaine, essentially, or it's not cocaine. It's like space drug, like sand, space sand. I'll just call it space. Yeah, space L- space LSD because it 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 does LSD. not. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It it does not cocaine. It's not. Yeah, it doesn't it, make you. It doesn't. Yeah, it, it's it's gonna give you visions. It's a hallucinogen more than uh, uh. Yeah, that makes sense. Let's go with that. Yeah. So and and then I mean, there's the the last two books. Uh, uh, even though there's technically a uh, Herbert basically uh, died before he could write the seventh book. So that's where Brian Herbert, his son, and Kevin J. Anderson sort of finished off uh, what would be that story. Basically, the last two books are Heretics of Dune and Chapter House Dune, um, which are... So if Dune and Dune Messiah is one story, Children of Dune and God Emperor is another story, Heretics and Chapter House is the next story, uh, which are largely like 1,500 to 2,000 years later after God Emperor of Dune. And it's about steering the future of the galaxy. It is a very much even more so an ensemble piece. And for me, at least, it's a bit closer to Isaac Asimov's Foundation Trilogy, which is sort of, there's a bunch of people that can sort of see the future and everyone is trying to be like, this is the direction that we're going to go. Um, And trying to steer the world, the galaxy towards our way from uh, Leto II's Golden Path. Uh, it's a lot of being, uh, Bene Gesserit stuff. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Bene Gesserit are, are a very strong part of the story all the way through, uh, which is why I'm still waiting for, there was supposed to be, as a part of uh, Denny's stuff, an HBO Max show about the Bene Gesserit. Uh, and it's still floating out there somewhere. Um, but yeah, Heretics and Chapter House. I don't know if you do those as a movie. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to be honest. Um, uh, both Heretics and Chapter House feel like they are uh, TV show stuff. Yeah, so if, yeah. if I were Mary, I would do Children of Dune and God Emperor. I can see somebody approaching those as films. But Heretics and Chapter House feel like television this would be like i feel like even the timeline on television stuff even if they made it simultaneously somehow because it does there's like a time skips in there right like there's you you could get away you you know you don't the cast that we're going to see pretty much are going to evaporate by the end of messiah right you can go for the most part you can you can kind of recast you can I, i i don't know like i was thinking about it while watching dune I was just kind of a tangent, but I was like, this is a story that's probably going to get retold a lot of times. And I feel the same way about, I've been watching a lot of uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, where it feels like it's a story that could be repurposed and retold a lot of times. Um, Like, you know, by the time we get to Messiah, it's going to be so long that we're going to forget about it. And we're going to be surprised when that trailer drops and we're going to get really excited. But then, you know, 10, 20 years from there, someone's going to look back at Dune and be like, with the technology we have now and, and kind of the effects that we're capable of, like, let's retell this story. Or, you know, maybe it goes on to inspire other types of fiction. But I think some of this stuff is just going to be hanging around for a while. Yeah. Uh, and again, the legendary, uh, at, like at the end of the day, like everyone like points at a, a company like Disney. And Disney is just one of the ones at the forefront. Warner Brothers, yada, yada. A company like Legendary, once they land on, oh, this is a hit. Mm. They're not letting that go. Despite... <laughs> yeah. Like Miller being like my artistic statement extends to Messiah, and that's mm-hmm. it. Like they will find someone to deliver these films, whether that's you know like an Alex Garland uh, or a Gareth Edwards. I'm I'm just thinking of like the sort of next like adjacent sci-fi-ish directors. Who could take it on? Yeah. Like, but yeah, he's almost untouchable at this point, especially with Dune part two. Now, like any stuff is like, just no matter what the the film is at this point, I'm like, I know I'm going to sit down and just like feast visually 
for two to three hours and you can kind of bet on that and there's other directors that are capable of that for sure but like yeah he he, he kind of hit it out of a park had it hit it out of the park in a way that's like between the source material and then the adaptation side and then you know making that just like just a like visually just absolutely stunning like i i don't know who th th this is going to be one of the better better dune things i think we have for like almost all time I, it's easy for me to say now it's like recency bias obviously but like i don't know i i, I mean i, I love it, that it, old it, stuff but this is just it's just such an amazing it. vision and again like like i've seen you know on the youtubes and other things like well dune is going to teach hollywood how to do it uh, and, well. <laughs> and sorry folks I, I just don't think that's true because at the end of the day like even back in the day you jump back 10 years 20 years 30 years like there's always amazing stuff and the amazing stuff sort of lives as a pillar in the middle of the average and the good and the bad and the like Lawrence of Arabia, um, which Dune takes a lot from even it like Lawrence of Arabia was a fantastically beautiful, amazing film. And around it, if you look at, at that time, there's just a lot of cruft too. Like there's a lot That's of good right. films. There's a lot of, great films there's a lot of trash there's a lot of um there's a lot of you know stuff that you love that you know is not all that great and that's that's how creativity is so i hope to see more stuff like dune but i also am not necessarily of the mindset that dune will change hollywood and change cinema and um I just hope uh, more creative people have a chance to tell interesting stories and Dune is an interesting story. That's a, that's a really good point. And I could add to that, but I think I want to leave it there. Cause I think that's just really well said. And, and there's probably an entire episode we could do about, uh, you know, budgets in terms of the, the gaming industry and in terms of Hollywood where the budgets are just so big and unsustainable in a way that it's like in order to make a Dune part two, the amount of things that have to come together just seem impossible, right? Like it's just, you have to have the right creative people who have a, a series of successful hits, right? For for, uh, for that amount of money and investment to be thrown at them, for them to be able to have their way with what they wanna do creatively. And it's just not gonna happen for a lot of people who are gonna take big swings and risks and do unique and interesting sci-fi. Like it's gonna come at a lower budget, right? And then maybe that stuff pops off and then it gets, you know, repurposed or re like put into the Hollywood machine and they'll say, okay, now we'll like do it up and, and do a blockbuster version or whatever. But, and, and I think something, it's very similar what happens with like games that take over the market, right? The smaller games that kind of take over the market. And then you see those mechanics, you see those um, progression systems and stuff make their way into those bigger titles. And so that's just kind of where we're at, like really well said about Dune. I think this is a good place to, to end our first kind of pilot episode here. It's really fitting. Mike, because you and I, the first video we were ever in, we talked about every single Dune video game that had been made up to that point when we recorded that. I forget how many years ago. Um, now that Rooster Teeth's shutting down, I think I'm going to try and find a way. I think I have that video on a hard drive somewhere. I'll probably find a way to republish it or put it somewhere. Oh, God, see. that was for. Wow. Yeah. It, see, again, the parallels, the time, everything comes full circle. We're Dune and Rooster Teeth, and now Rooster Teeth <laughs> is gone. And we're talking about Dune again. Uh fascinating all right thank you everybody uh you know let us in the know in the comments if you liked it and uh hopefully we'll be back next week with a new topic something fun to talk about uh and it, and it could be anything it could be anything you know this is generally primarily a video game channel but you know we got mike here someone i consider to be very intelligent and kind of has encyclopedic knowledge about lots of different subjects other than gaming you've got mike you've got the film on tap you've got the comic book history you got it all up there and so I'm really excited to kind of just work with you and, and just like pick your brain about all these different things and, and, and topics. So I'm really looking forward to, to making more of these shows. And I'm looking forward to doing research to make myself look, look like I know everything ahead of every episode. <laughs> I got to start, I got to start keeping up, man. I got to do brain exercise. <laughs> all right. Thanks everyone for watching. We'll hopefully catch you next week. When that happens, she gets burned. They burn 
what looks to be an airy where they have a bunch of birds. Mm -hmm. So I assume that's probably a food source. I thought that those were messenger pigeons. I know exactly what you're talking about now. I thought well, those were messenger be. pigeons and then the, it was like the Harkonnens just being dicks. Like they we're going to, you know, destroy I mean, your, I mean, it, it definitely, it, it definitely was, but probably they eat that as well. You know what? I, that's, you know, that's fair. I wasn't you, actually expecting you, you to waste, have a good. <laughs> you don't waste anything in the desert. That's right. Yeah. You never waste anything in the desert.